take a minute and look at the old example we did, then we're going to build another example um, that will also be very simple. And we'll build on it, though. We're going we're gonna to take this next, next example and do a bunch of different things with it. All right, so... Let me pull up the example from last time. They'll be in the folders, as will the lecture videos. So under modules for the given week, the, the examples and the lectures will be there. We had a simple example, Java class. Of the two files, again, to create, the one that's most critical to have is the .java, because you can always recompile it and get the .class file, get the object code. So, and so that's the one that you can turn in. Um, typically, just depending on goofy things like version and things like that, I, I need you to, to submit just the .java file, unless otherwise instructed, because I probably will recompile it anyhow as part of my process. Plus, I need to see exactly what you do. Remember, programming isn't all about getting the right results, but doing things in the best, best way possible. So we look at this. I'm going to open that up in Notepad. few observations that I will repeat um, from last time. The, classes, the file name that the class is in is the class name.java. So example.java for the class example. We have um, at least one of your classes needs a main method. And the main method is what runs when you start up the, when you run your app, when you run your class. And your main method will look exactly like that. Public, static, void, main, and then having arguments of string arguments, which you could theoretically use to pass arguments into your um, class via the um, command line. And you could do that. We're, we probably won't do that, but you could. This particular example is doing something similar to the Madlib assignment that you have, um, where it gave me a card, gave me a single card from a deck of cards by generating two random numbers, um, one for the suit and one for the, the, the value of the card. We have two arrays, the suits, which have four elements in it, and the cards, which have 13 elements in it. We generate a random number. We use the length of the array to multiply by the random and convert that, or rather truncate that, into an in integer. Um, and in that way, we get a value from one, I'm sorry, from zero to one less than the number of elements in the array which is exactly what we want, because that's how the subscript of an array runs. The possible subscript for the, for the suits array is 0, 1, 2, and 3. So the sub, possible subscripts from an array run from 0 through um, 1 less than a number of elements in it. So that works. We then use the system out to, to print the two random numbers, and we print a message saying what card they drew. To compile this, you need to go to the command line. I'm going to try to make this bigger. You need to get into the right folder. If you're on the desktop when you start the command line, or if your files are on the desktop, when you start your command line, typically you are started in your user's folder, your user's directory. And the desktop is directly underneath that. So to get into the desktop, you typically would only type in C desktop, CD space desktop. That takes you to the desktop. CLS is useful because that allows you to clear the screen. Sometimes if you're doing a bunch of stuff, you know, you could get confused and have old error messages and, and things along that lines. To compile, type Java C space and the name of the Java class file, which is the class name.java. 
it will do its thing. No news is good news. If nothing pops up, then there is no error, and you should be able to run it. You run it by typing in Java and the name of the class that has the main in it. So in this case, I chose a 1 and a 4 randomly, and that translates to the 6 of diamonds. Any questions about this? Yes? The print LN says the print line. Yeah. Runs it. Okay, that's not that's not in. That's print LN. Yeah. So like print line. So it does a print on a new line. In other words. No, no, that, that's an LN. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you can you can escape the So if you did a backslash and that would probably put it on a new line. That should work as well. we'll save this as something else. And then we're going to do a little simple tip calculator. Tip calculator is as good as anything, right? Why not? All right, so I'm going to go up here, File, Save As. All files. We'll call this tip. We might change the name of this class, but I'll worry about that later. So I'm going to go in and change the name of it here to match the name of the file name. And let's go in and let's make a decidedly not earth-shattering application. Let's define a double for the amount of the meal. Let's define a double for the tip. Let's define a double for the total. And we'll say the amount is equal to $63. Yes. Because I'm programming in Java? Okay. Is decimal a valid no. primitive? Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you see, you don't confuse me like that. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. All right. So I make it a double. I could. What I thought you were going to ask, and here this is why I'm not a mind reader. I thought you were going to ask, could you do that? And the answer is, of course you could. You could declare the variable. Well, your question was good. Don't, don't, don't criticize it. All right. So the amount is $63, let's say. Now, tip is, of course, the standard tip is 15%. So I'll say 15 times amount. Then I'll do something like total equals amount plus tip. And I'll do some prints.
All right. And if I typed everything right and everything, this should work. I just really have in my main I have declared doubles for these things, did an assignment statement, did a calculation, did another assignment statement. Pardon me? Where am I missing a bracket? Scrolled off the page. So, we should be okay, and if we're not, the compiler will tell us. All right, so let's go and save this. And let's compile it. Java C, what did I call it again? Indeed I did, tip calculator.java. All right, I run it, and it gives me what I hope to be correct response. How would I know that this is correct? Now, here's one thing again. One thing that I have noticed, these are just a general observation about students, not about you folks, okay? But, you know, it's worthwhile to think about this, all right? How do I know my program worked? Yes. Yeah, I check it with pen and paper or with a calculator or something like that. All right. Now, this is a very simple example, right? There's only one thing to check. I could go and pull it up and multiply that. That seems about right to me. Try doing it in my head, I believe that is correct. Uh, and if the tip is correct, the sum is correct. So I think this is correct. All right. Now, as this became more complicated, if I were to say, for example, that we're going to look at the level of service and give a 10% tip if the service was mediocre, a 15% if the service was average, and a 20% if the, the service was great, then we would need to test a variety of conditions. All right? And it goes and it escalates from there, almost like exponentially. Let's say there's different rules for tip for delivery versus um, at a sit-down restaurant, right? You're not probably not going to tip the pizza guy as much as you're going to tip the waiter in a pizza restaurant, even if the bill's the same. Probably not, all right? So the more conditions and parameters and stuff like that we add, testing's going to become complicated. And you really only know if it works if you comprehensively test it. And so one thing that you want to do, and I very well might add as a condition uh, to some of the assignments is to do a test plan. A test plan is where you identify the different scenarios that you're going to test. All right? And part of your job is to identify a good number of test scenarios, one that is going to be comprehensive and will cover, again, I hesitate to say literal, literally every possibility, but every possibility that appears to be relevant. So for example, if I ran this calculation a couple times, three, four times, and put in a different number each time, and every time it came to be correct, I probably wouldn't need to run it for every possible value from one to a trillion dollars to assure that it works, right? Because if it worked for $98 and $99 and $100 and $101, chances are it's going to work for $102, all right? On the other hand, if there is some kind of condition that says that uh, bills over $200, we expect an extra tip, well, then I would test at $199.99. 200, $200.01 to make sure that I handle that condition correctly, all right? So, be thinking in those terms. Ideally, your test condition should cover every path that your program could go through. Well, guess what? 
there's not too many paths this program can go through, right? Boom, beginning to end. All right? Now, what's the drawback? Uh, what's the downside? Uh, what's not good about this program? Well, no one's really in the market for an application that will calculate how much a tip you should leave on a precisely $63 amount at a restaurant. All right, not really a lot of benefit to, to that. All right, so what does that mean? All right, well, how would we actually make this into an application, a real application? All right, yeah, you'd probably tie this to a GUI, in other words. All right, you'd tie this to a GUI. In other words, you'd have a text box for someone to enter in a value. All right, maybe this would be a Java app, or maybe it would be an app for Android, because Android uses Java as a programming language. But there'd be a place for you to enter in the amount, maybe some kind of place to select the level of service that you got. You'd press a button, and then boom, this code would click in. All right, if you look in the syllabus, and you look in the book, we don't talk about GUIs for a long time. All right, so what are we going to do? What we're going to do is this. We are going to create little test programs to test our code. All right? We're going to create, when you create these classes, effectively you're creating components. And these are components that you can plug into anywhere. All right? How many of you happen to have headphones with you? All right, one. We'll pretend I do. Two, I do. All right, and let's imagine some of you other folks did. Whose headphones would work in this computer? Everyone's. Why is that? Well, because the headphones is a component. As long as it fits certain characteristics, you can plug it in anywhere that you want. So this doesn't work simply for one brand of, of, of uh, headphone or whatever. It's written as a component so you can go and plug stuff in. So anywhere you need headphones. So the computer has a place to put headphones in. Phones do. Walkmans do. Um, the um, control panel at Duck Radio has a place to plug in headphones. All right? Any place that a headphones are needed, anyone's headphones are going to work because you just plug them in and boom, they work. Our goal for software is to create components where we can plug them in wherever we need that bit of functionality and it will work. So let's think about tip calculation. All right, it's pretty straightforward, it's pretty simple. But if we think about it, it doesn't take too much of, a, of imagination to figure out um, how within an app we might use a tip calculation in a couple different places. All right, we may have a tip calculator. That is, you enter the amount, you um, Type the level of service in, you make a selection from a list of service, uh, level of services, whatever. You click the calculate button and it gives you what the suggested tip amount is. That's one usage of it. You might have your application prepare a tip chart. You know, sort of like one of them old school things, like you used to see them like on the back of like business cards and all that, that they'd have like, here's a calendar and a tip calculator, buy insurance from me, or something like that, right? So we could have our application print a chart that said tip and had maybe a dollar amount and had how much the tip could be. I don't know, maybe someone would rather look at that than do a calculator. The advantage of doing that is you don't have to like sit there and key in and decide. You can just at a glance look at all these different things. All right. So again, work with me here. All right. You might want to do something like this. All right. You might have uh, at the same restaurant that is doing this tip calculation um, might have like a banquet service where they, uh, where you're estimating how much your banquet's going to cost, and one of the things that you are going to estimate is how much the tips are going to be for all the, the wait staff, maybe. All right? So, you know, it might do the calculation on that page. That if, you, if you're having, 
if you're planning a party of, of 15 at the, at the restaurant, here is a suggested tip value that we would expect, just to let you know. The idea is, is that almost any piece of functionality, you can think of places where it potentially could be used. All right? And the idea is, is we don't want to have to reinvent that functionality. We don't have to, we don't want to make a special tip calculating class to, to, to calculate average service tips and exceptional service tips and poor service tips or tips for $63, tips for $98 and so on and so on and so forth. Typically, this is going to be connected to some GUI, this component. And the GUI will feed the component with the information it needs to do its job, and it will display the results. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to use test classes instead. And what are test classes? Test classes are classes that are going to test the components that we build to make sure that they're correct. So from second assignment, on, you're not going to have only one class. You're going to have at least two classes. You're going to have the component that you're building, and you're going to have the class to test that component. All right? So, another, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name of this guy to test. I said I was going to change the name of this. So, I'm going to change the name of that class to test tip calculator test and I'll go and change the name of the file as well. All right. All right. I'm going to make another class that I'm going to call tip calculator. Now this class doesn't have a main in it. This is a component. And remember, what's the idea of a component? A component is something we can plug in anywhere. So this isn't going to be a standalone class. Just like headphones aren't like a standalone audio component. You got these headphones. Oh great, I got these headphones. You don't really work or do anything unless you plug them into something. Yeah, I, I guess. I guess. Or if you want to pretend you're busy so that like, yeah. So, but for the most part, they don't really perform their function unless they're plugged into something. And that will be the same idea here. So I'm going to have two classes here. I'm going to have my component that I'm building that's called the tip calculator. Now, everything about calculating tips for my organization is going to go here. Every single thing about calculating tips is going to go here. So if my tip calculator wants to accommodate delivery versus dine-in, if it wants to accommodate good service, mediocre service, poor service, if it wants to accommodate parties over eight, have a special suggested tip amount, any of that knowledge about the tip is going to belong in this class, okay, and only this class. When I do that, this will become a component, and I can plug that component into any application that I want to, or any other class that I want to that needs to do a tip calculation. So thinking back to my app that's going to generate a tip table that looks like this. I'm going to plug my tip calculator into that. Think about the tip calculator GUI where I amount of it, I type in what level of service it is and I hit calculate and it shows me the, the amount. I'm going to use the tip, calc uh, the, the tip class component for this as well. All right. So I'm going to write my component in such a way that I don't have to run it as a stand around uh, alone program, but I can call it from whoever needs to. And the test class that I've created here is going to be the 
program. that I'm going to run it from, that I'm going to test it from. This is known, by the way, as unit testing. All right? Unit testing is where you test a component. System testing is where you test everything together. All right? So let's say you bought from a store a, a fancy computer system that contained speakers and headphones and monitors and all kinds of cool stuff. An example of unit testing might be the person who's building the computer for you, let's say, let's say they're custom building it, to take the speakers that they're planning on giving you and plug it into a jack and make sure that they work. All right, That would be unit testing. I'm testing that one component. Then there might be a test to make sure the monitor works. Then there might be a test to test that this component works and that component works. So you can test components individually to make sure that little piece of it works. All right? However, if the person building the computer for you is good, they're also probably going to do a system test. And what's a system test? That's when you put all the components together and make sure that the whole thing works as a unit. All right? My speakers could work and I still might not get audio from my computer. Why not? Well, a bunch of reasons. All right, there's a bunch of reasons why that could be. The point is, is if you troubleshoot and you identify that the component works, if it stops working when you put it together, you know that it probably has something to do with the way that certain things are connected or whatever, and it can help you with troubleshooting. So at any rate, our tip test, tip calculator test is going to be a, become our unit test. In fact, let's call it that, unit test. That's probably a better name still. And I'll go out here and I'll rename this to unit test. because it's going to test my tip calculator class. All right, so there we go. Now, I'm going to make my tip calculator class, I'm going to put something in it. All right, I'm going to put a method in it. Classes can have two things. They can have attributes and they can have methods. And we'll talk more about this, but to start out, I want to do a method. And all I want to do in this method is duplicate the simplistic functionality we had before. And that is, you give me the amount of the, of the meal, and I'll tell you what the suggested tip is. All right? And that's all it will do, and it will just assume 15% for a tip. We'll later expand this to include other parameters too. So I'm going to create a method. Public. Public indicates that this method is available from the outside world. All right. Which if you think about a component, a component should have at least some public methods. All right. Because the whole idea of components is using a component in different places to do some particular task. So there sort of needs to be a public method so that the outside world can talk to this method and can talk to this class. So it's going to start out public. Why would I make a method private, by the way? Can anyone think of a case where a method would be private? Maybe some kind of security. Keep in mind, we're not talking about other users knowing about this. We're talking about other programmers, other people accessing and using our code. Well, again, you know, we're talking about people that are working in your development team. So if they have the code, then that's probably not an issue. Well, not necessarily.
Maybe. Yes. Probably not. Pardon me? That's a good question. I'm not sure if that, that would have an impact if you declared it private. I'm not sure how internally that would get uh, affect the storage. Yes. I'm going to expand on that a little bit. Um, all the answers may or may not apply in given circumstances or whatever, but I like that answer the best. I'm thinking of like something that is like an intermediary step in a calculation. All right? That to calculate something, maybe you go through three or four steps. And the outside world may say, calculate this. And the class might have three or four steps it goes through before it comes up with the final answer. And in those cases, those three or four steps might be part of a process that you can't outside world will have no need to call like one of those steps. You're either going to call the one function or you're not going to call any of them. So it's sort of like an intermediary step where it's a piece of code that's needed to do the job, but the outside world doesn't need to worry about it. All right. So you'll make your methods public that you want the outside world to see, sort of things that are like internal to the um, uh, process you uh, make uh, private. A great example of that, I think, comes from the world of hardware again. Notice when I talk about a headphone jack. What is the public method for a headphone jack in a computer? It's the little socket in the little audio out socket that you plug into. In other words, you do not have to open your computer case, strip the wires of your headphone, solder it onto the sound card or something like that. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, you know, there's a lot that could go wrong if you do that. They provide you who's using these components, and again, remember, we're talking about programmers, not users, but still, in this context, the programmers are using components that others have written, and the idea is, is we're still going to protect those people from doing damage by going and trying to subvert the normal way and jumping in on the middle and soldering onto a sound card instead of just using the plug-in. So, for the most part, though, the methods we're going to create are going to be public because we want the outside world. What's the next thing that we define with a method? Well, if it's static or if it's not static. In this case, this is not going to be static, so we don't need to say anything there. We, the return value, the type return value. And what would that be? Double. And we'll call the function calc. The other thing we have to define is what? What we're passing into it. In other words, the drawback of our original, um, original um, app that we wrote was that it was, it was a tip calculator for exactly, exactly $63 meals at average service. Well, we might want to, um, you know, change that up a little bit. In our GUI, we're going to get that value from a text box. In our test class, we may run through it a couple different ways. We might run a random number generator and just randomly generate meal costs from anywhere between 10 and $200. We could do that. We could run a loop where we tested every dollar amount from one to $300 and, and verify that that's correct, or whatever. All right? But the idea is, is that somehow this class is getting the value that it's doing the calculating on from the outside world. All right? And in this case, it's an argument. We specify the type of the argument. 
I usually like to proceed the arguments with arg. All right. In this case, I declare my double of, I'm going to name it answer, just for demonstration purposes. Answer equals arg cost times 0.15. And then finally, we're going to return the value. Doing a, a function and not returning a value is kind of like, uh, and again, it's possible to do that. There's no return value in the main function, for example. But in calculations like this, the return value is kind of like giving your answer. The, the, the class or the method giving its answer to the outside world. It's like the old joke, you know, the old gag they used to do in those old corny movies. Do you know what time it is? Guy looks at his watch, yes, and then walks off, you know. It's like the whole idea of asking someone what time it is is to get back. Yes, it is 2 o'clock or whatever. So the return value is the answer that's going to be returned in. Notice in this example, this method is like what people refer to as a black box. That is, it gets this information from the outside world. It doesn't care where that that argument cost came from. It could come from a GUI. Right? Could from, come from a text box where someone types it in. It could come from a loop that is looping through and preparing a chart of tips from one to three hundred dollars. It could come from a random number generator. It doesn't care. When we call this function, we're going to give it a cost, and this is what it's going to do with the cost. The last part, the return value, is we don't care whoever calls this, what you do with the tip. Maybe you display the tip and say your suggested tip is $25. Maybe you don't display the tip but just add it on and say your total amount including tip is $73 or whatever. Functions like this take what they uh, need, do the job, and return the answer, return the value. All right. How that argument gets filled in, where that number comes from, and what happens to the answer once it's returned, that's someone else's problem. That's the problem of whatever component is, component is using it. You know, it's kind of like headphones. Headphone you plug into the jack, it doesn't matter what music you're listening to, or whose ears it goes on, or whatever. All right. You plug it in, it does its job, and it will work regardless. Same thing here. All right, so the first thing I want to do is let's convert the program we had before. Let's con convert our unit test class to now use the tip calculator class. We have to declare another variable. We, def we declare a variable of type tip calculator. All right. A class that we make is sort of like our own custom data type. All right. We're going to make one of these. Now, some terminology I heard someone say, this is a class. Think of a class as a template for this sort of thing, this calculating a tip. It's like a data type. 
All right, we're going to do a tip kind of calculation. And this is a template for that. TC is a variable. All right, it's called an object reference variable. It relates to a specific tip calculation. So, let's think of another scenario where we could use this in, in a real application. Let's say you go and you have, you're eating with four people and they all have separate checks. All right? You could have, instead of one tip box or check, uh, text box, you could have four text boxes, one for person A, one for person B, C, and D. You put in their amounts, click the button, and it tells each of those people how to calculate their tip. In which case, there's one tip class, because there's one set of rules for determining a tip, and that is contained in the tip calculator class. However, we have four individual specific tips that are calculated. So we would have four objects in that case. Tip object for person B, a tip object for person C, for person D, for person A, whatever. All right, yes? You could put constraints in code that would do that, but I really can't think of a case of why I would want to do that. Um, well, I can think of a case of why I want to do why I would want to do that. Um, and, and maybe this gets to your answer, and maybe it doesn't. Let's say you know we talked about cards the last assignment. All right. Let's say we were going to make a deck of cards. All right. There'd be a card class and a deck class. The deck class would be limited to how many cards? It would be limited to 52 cards. All right, so there could be a constraint in your class that says, well, this consists of a certain number of these, because that's the rules. You know, tires on a car, you know, there's four of them. So you could do that, but that would be building that constraint within the code of like some other class because, you know, there really isn't. In, in, in pure OO design, there really isn't that sort of thing. You can't design it that way. It would be the manner in which you used it. All right. So this I could do alternately as two lines. And I'll put in comments an alternate way to do this. Because this line actually combines two things. I don't need to both, that's why I comment one of them out. But this does these two things in one line. Let's look at this step by step. Tip calculator TC. What that means is I'm going to have a variable named TC. Kind of like this says I'm going to have a variable called AMT. What is the difference though? There's a couple differences. One difference is in this case I'm making a primitive. What's a primitive in Java? A primitive is just a data value that really all it has is a value. This I'm making was called an object reference. And an object reference can have properties and methods. It can be a bunch of stuff associated with an object. Whereas with a primitive, primitive implies simple, basic. There's only one thing, the value. So here I'm creating a variable called TC that is of type tip calculator, which means TC is the object. Tip calculator is a class. So put a tip calculator object, actually an object pointer or an object reference in the variable TC. At this point, there is nothing in TC at this point, like right here. If I try to do
It's a null object. Objects are different than primitives. To use a primitive, you simply declare it, and then you can do anything you want to with it. You can set its value. An object, you have to declare it and create it. All right? So here's where I have my variable. What I put in there? I want to make a new tip calculator object. So this is part of the initialization, and we'll speak a lot more about this. The bottom line is, is in order to use an object, you must do sort of declare it and initialize it. All right. To declare it, you simply give the type and the name of the variable. To initialize it, you're going to use the new. This creates a new object. One sort of good trick question that I could ask on a midterm or a final relates to how many objects that you have. Because we'll talk about object pointers and we'll go through some exercises to, to clarify that. In a nutshell, new creates one object. So I could have 50 different one of these statements. Tip calculator TC equal, uh, or tip calculator TC, tip calculator TC1, tip calculator TC2, tip calculator TC3. If the question is how many objects got created, you would look for the number of news because this is simply declaring the variable. All right, declaring the object reference. This is actually creating the object. So, There's sort of two steps in that, declaring the variable and initializing the object. Now at this, now, now this is simply a shorthand that does both those steps all in one. This. declares and creates at the same time. So, now I want to go, go ahead. Yes. Like later on in the game if I wanted to clear the slate and start with a new object, could I say TC equals new again? Yes, you could. All right. The question then becomes what happens to the objects that you created, and we'll, uh, previously we'll talk about that more in a subsequent class. All right, now I have the object that I can do something with. All right, so now my amount is $63. My tip calculation, well, I'm not going to do here. I'm going to ask the tip object to calculate the tip. So, I'm going to say tip, I'm sorry, tc dot, what did I call it, calc? Yeah, calc, and I'm going to pass it the amount as the argument. Now, students, when they invariably see something like this, think like, are we making it more complicated just to make it more complicated? And the answer is, of course we are. That's why, you, no, 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 no. The answer is of course we're not. All right. Remember, our idea here is building a component. Something that's not going to just calculate the, the value of $63 lunches, the tip for them, but calculate for anything. And something that we could plug into and use anywhere where we needed to do a tip calculation. Whether it be creating a chart, or whether it be doing a calculation for one person, for five people, whatever. So, what this says literally is, I'm going to, on this object, call the method calc, give it this value as its parameter, so whatever value is in amount, in our case 63, 
call that method, whatever value that method returns, store it into tip. And then the rest of it should work the same. Now notice that, again, I deliberately called the return value from this method something other than tip to show you that this returns the answer. It's up to whoever calls the function what they do with that answer. So in this case, we're storing the answer in the variable called tip. We can then do with what we want. We could output, it out, we could output the total, whatever. The more a function is like a black box where it takes a known input, does its thing, and produces a result, the more reusable it's going to be. Let's go and let's make sure this works. Now, there's a couple ways I could compile this. What I often do with student stuff is I will say Java C star Java. That will simply compile everything that ends in a Java extension. That's why it's important, by the way, if you have like extraneous classes in your Java pro program to get rid of them. Because probably I'm going to try and compile them. All right? Just the way I grade things, it's easy for me to just type in Java C star dot Java. All right? Now, the other thing we can do. So I got rid of all the classes. If I compile one class and that class uses another class, the compiler's smart enough to go and compile the other class as well. So in this case, unit test uses tip calculator. So if I compile unit test, it will also compile tip calculator. So I could say Java C, Lava C, Java C, unit test dot Java. And when I do that, I do a dir star class. I lied. It did not do that. Oh, well, I don't know. Did I save? Did I save tip calculator? I don't think I saved tip calculator, so there's nothing to compile. Now it compiled just by saying Java unit test, it compiled both of them. Right now, we're going to keep them in the same directory. Yes. Yes. To work together without having to specify where to find the other class. Because, you know, you can put things in their own, they're called in Java, they're called packages. So that, like, for example, you know, if you had a really big application and different teams working on different parts of it, you might have different pieces of it in different packages, and that way you wouldn't have everything in there. All right? But for now, to keep it simple, we'll do that. Now, to run this, I just type in Java unit test, and that does its thing, does the calculation, and outputs the answer. Okay? All right. Next time we'll work on doing a little more rigorous unit test. That is, let's make a random number generator to generate and to do some calculations. Let's put a loop in there so that we can generate the chart of $1 through $300. All right. Then let's start making it more complicated where we have associated with the tip class maybe some attributes and uh, things like that. So we'll extend this example here. All right. The important thing here is the reason we do this is to separate stuff into components so it's reusable. Remember, almost any reason, anything that I define as being like a good programming practice is for that reason, for maintainability purposes. So we now have a component that does a tip calculation. To be sure, it's a simplistic tip calculation, but it does it. Anywhere in our application where we need to do that, uh, that calculation, we can do it. 
All right. Um, all right, we'll see you up in lab.